baptize thee, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost.
I see prophecy fulfilled And the signs of the time They're appearing everywhere I can almost hear the fall
I said, where can I get it? They said, go to Story Electric. I said, how do you get there? He told me. And he gave me the wrong direction. I found Story Electric. When I went in, nobody there. I said, is anybody here? And finally, an elderly man came doing that old man shuffle out of the back. And he said, can I help you? I said, I want a section of holes like this. He said, it'll be in a different color. I said, color don't bother me. He looked and said, I don't have it. I said, where can I get it? And they said, you need to go to Advance Auto. I said, how do I get there? He sent me to Advance Auto. Went in, he looked at it, we measured, said, I'll be right back. I got my money out, I was ready to pay. He came back out, said, I don't have it. He said, I just sold my last. I said, where can I get it? He said, go to O'Reilly's. I said, how do I get to O'Reilly's? I went to O'Reilly's, walked in. And I said, I want a section of holes. He went back, came back, and said, I don't have it. <laughs> and I said, where can I get it? Across the street. <laughs> I went over. And this was, I'll tell you what. I was about up to you. You don't know what I mean. <laughs> In our trip, nothing to it. Go get it. Go on about your business. Went in, I said, I want a section of hose. He said, what does that go on? <laughs> he had his computer. I said, it goes on my hot rod. Well, what kind is it? I explained. He said, we don't have that in here. I said, here's the hose. <laughs> Just go back there. And look, it's a three-eighths hose. Cut me eight and a half feet. I'll pay you, and I'll go Here's the hope. <laughs> By that time, I mean, it was up to you. <laughs> and I got it, and I got in the car, and I started home, got through Paducah, and I got tickled. <laughs> you know why? Test and tune. The Lord was testing, and then he tuned me. He's getting me where I could run right. Have you ever been in those testing chairs? Man, I, I told Bob, I said, really, I don't want any more of those. He has got my attention. He can quit testing and cheering on me. I think I'm running about right. So every time you have a good day, look out, there's a car coming to sorry. And any time you think, I don't care how kind the people you are, somebody is going to irritate you. All right. And you keep that in mind all the way through the preaching. I didn't know the Lord was going to let me have that example this week, but he has. In the book of Luke, the second chapter, if you would please. Luke, the second chapter, I want you to look at the 44th and 45th verse. And then in Luke 24, I want you to look at the 15th verse. Luke 2, 44 and 45. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolks and acquaintances, and when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. Look over in Luke 24 and 15. 24 and 15. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. <clears throat> now, these two places is in contrast to each other. In all four Gospels, they all write and give in a different account. But I want you to pay close attention. In the book of John, the first chapter, in John, the 21st chapter, it talked about Jesus, and as Jesus went, they were following him in the book of John. He's the great shepherd, giving directions, they were following. But now in Luke, he pictures it this way. They were walking alongside of Jesus. Jesus is not ahead of us anymore, trying to lead us. But Jesus walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death, through every problem, every circumstance, and everything that happens to us in this life. How does he do it? 
He does it because when we got saved, that He come to live in our life through the power of the Holy Spirit, and we become His children. Amen. Now in Luke, the second chapter, it talked about the parents of Jesus. Now He had a earthly mother, Mary, but He had no earthly father except in the eyes of the world. Now Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit of God, a son, and he was God made manifest in the flesh. That's how God got to this earth. And when he was birthed, he was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So as Mary and Joseph's tradition was, they went to Jerusalem once a year at the Feast of the Passover. You remember the story in the Old Testament when Israel was uh, in captivity uh, to Egypt? And Pharaoh had received all the plagues. Then God told the children of Israel to take and plant, uh, paint the door of the blood over their lintels and over their doorposts. And when the death angel passed over, everyone that was under that protection would not suffer the death of their firstborn. Remember that? Amen. Now, we're seeing Jesus here along with his mother and earthly father. They went to Jerusalem for the Feast of the Passover. It says that was their custom. Now at the Feast of the Passover, that's when you would have your sins atoned for. They didn't get to go to church. The church hadn't been established. They didn't have to get to ask God for forgiveness of their sins because it, the church had not come. Jesus had not gone to the cross and died for their sins. But here's what happened. They went to Jerusalem and they offered a sacrifice to the high priest. The priest would take it into the holies of holies and make an atonement for their sin. So when they got there, they did that and it says that they left. They left, but they left something behind. Can you tell me what it was? Jesus. Jesus. Do you know many of us walk in this life and we leave Jesus behind because we're too busy to know where he's at. Are you still there? They, the Bible said they supposing, supposing that he was in their company. How often have we supposed that he was there? What keeps him from being there is our relationship to God. What breaks that relationship to God is sin. If there's no repentance of that sin, then that relationship is broken. It does not mean that he has left us, that he's not inside of us, but our fellowship has been severed. And they suppose it. Now, in this day and time, we want to call child's Social services, would Unfit mother, unfit daddy. Who would go to a city, leave their son there, and not know that he was alone? You ever been to town with your children, and you look up on the shelf to get something, <coughs> and you look around, and they're gone? That's an exciting time, isn't it? <laughs> Where did they go? You supposedly thought that you told them to stand there, and when you looked, they weren't there. They had gone someplace else. So they supposedly thought that Jesus was there. Look at the 44th verse, one that we read. But they supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they saw among their kinfolks and acquaintances. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, how could anybody go a day without knowing whether or not their son was with them? Well, I don't know how many of us that have gotten saved never pray, never read our Bibles, go to church occasionally, and we're thinking all the time that we're godly walking in the light. That's good stuff, isn't it? They didn't look. They didn't see whether or not their son was. 
They walk today, and then, what were they talking about? I'm sure they were talking about, did you see so-and-so up at the temple? Did you see so -and -so? Well, this one I didn't see. Did you see them? Their acquaintances, their friends, they weren't looking for Jesus. He was not there. And then it says, after they had gone a day's journey, somebody said, Mary and Joseph, hey, where's Jesus? So they inquired of Jesus to their kinfolks and to their acquaintances. Now, if you're not saved, where are you looking to see Jesus? Well, my mother, she was a dear saint, my sister. Look at all your acquaintances. You will not find Christ there. You'll only find Christ when Christ comes looking for you. So we see it took one day for them to walk away from Jesus. But it took them three days in order to find Him. It always takes longer to get back where you started than it does to stay where you're at where you started. Well, that's some more good stuff. So we see him. What was he doing? Well, when they found him after three days, they found him in the temple, and Mary said to him, Why have you done this to us? It wasn't that he'd done that to them. They had done that to them. They should have been looking in the first place. They ought to have been asking in the first place. But it didn't work that way. What was Jesus doing? She said, you caused us to cry. You've caused us heartache. How many of you parents here today have a wayward son, a wayward daughter, and it breaks your heart? You do everything that you can in order to let them see the truth, but they're not. But there's a difference in what Jesus was doing. He had stayed in the temple, and he was asking questions. Asking. And he was answering questions. Two things. He was trying to understand. Then when they came, Mary came and said, Why are you doing this to us? He said, I must be about my father's business. So what kind of business was he being about? Number one, he was in God's house. The father's business was in God's house. What was he doing there? He was talking to the religious bunch that did not know God, that had a form of godliness, but denied the power of God. He was there, and it says that they were confounded. They were confounded at the things that he said unto them. They said, he's just a child. Now, one other thing I want to point out before we move over to 24th chapter. The day that we're born as children, it's what we call the age of accountability. A baby's born, if that baby dies, God's not going to hold that baby accountable for sin. Maybe they're two years old, three, four, five. This is what we call, when does a child reach the age of accountability? When I was growing up, I asked that question. When do I become accountable for my sin? They told me at age 12. Where did they get that? Because Jesus stayed at the temple when he was 12 years old. Let me tell you, I'm not Jesus and you're not Jesus. I've seen three, four, five, six, seven, eight-year-old, ten-year-old children to get saved. It's not a matter of you coming to me and said, Preacher, will you bless my baby? I can't bless your baby. That's God's business. Can you confirm my baby? I can't confirm your baby anywhere. That's God's business. So when does a child come to the age of accountability? When God speaks to the heart of that child and they realize that they're lost. When they realize they're lost and they need Christ in their life, that's 
when they become to the age of accountability. Amen. Yeah. What age is that? I don't know. It's up to that individual. All I can say is not every child grows at the same level physically. Not every child grows at the same level mentally. Only when God speaks to your heart can you be saved. That's when you reach the age of accountability. Now, if you're here lost this morning and you have never been saved, you're not going to go to heaven. I got the word from last week after I preached last week. They said, don't go up to Grace Valley because that guy is wild. <laughs> you know what I heard? He preaches on hell. Sometimes, the only time we ever hear about hell is when somebody tells us to go. <laughs> I've been told where to go a lot. You just go to I say, nope. I got that fixed. I'm not going. Amen. If that's where you want to go, don't get fixed. Don't let you, the blood of Jesus be applied to you. Don't get saved. So, things keep us from taking Jesus with us. Going to touch this briefly and go on. This is public knowledge. I talk about my wife a lot. I talk about the children a lot. Talk about myself more than I ought to. But back years ago when we were living in Kentucky, Barbara's already given this testimony at the Ladies' Prayer. Barbara got addicted to prescription drugs. I knew it, but she had lied about it. Preachers, why? Listen, folks, we are not immune to anything. They caught her. They put her in jail. I got the call. She called me. Long story short, she went to rehab. Your wife's been to rehab? Yeah, but a bunch of you here need to be. <laughs> That's good preaching. <coughs> How did she get addicted? Well, back years and years and years ago, she went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you, you've got problems with your nerves. You got a little pain. I'm going to write you some war times. I'm going to give you some Percocet. I'm going to give you some Oxycontin. That's fine. Our doctors today, I could be a doctor. You know how? Our doctors, they ask you what your symptoms and they punch it in the computer, and the computer says, this is what it is, give them that. They sit down and write it, and you take it back home. On that prescription, it said, three times, two times, four times a day, take this. Well, you take it, and it feels so good, you go back and say, I want another hit of that. And then before long, it gets worse and worse and worse. Amen. My thing wasn't <coughs> prescription pills. Mine was whiskey. Amen. What's the difference in whiskey and over-the-counter? You can smell whiskey, but you can't smell over-the-counter. <laughs> now, we that drank or did drink and did do pills, what's how many of us would go out on the street and buy coke crack cane? How many of us would buy meth? I don't want that junk in me. What's the difference? I won't give up. You done got quiet on me. Why? That's a nerve. That's a nerve. I am glad to say that I live with a life today that through Christ Jesus has broken addiction. Amen. I am thrilled about that. It's made our lives worthy. We have a life. 
to me, deny, 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 deny. Didn't have a problem. <coughs> had a problem, didn't know how to problem. Well, nothing wrong with drinking a little beer. That's all right. <coughs> you take one sip before long, you're on a case a week. A case a day. Two cases a day. <coughs> before long, you quit your job. Before long, you and your wife's fussing, fighting, and grabbing. Before long, all these problems take place. Why is it? Some say, well, I'm saved. If you're saved and act like that, man, you left Christ way back down the road. Amen. You forgot to look around and see where Jesus was at in your life. And the devil has thrown you a curveball and you were a sucker. That's a sucker pitch. Amen. Amy's husband, Joe, when we were growing up, man, he could throw the best curveball I could ever see. <coughs> I could hit a fastball out of the park every time, and I was a sucker for a curveball. It would be coming straight at me, and I'd say, this is it. And that thing, when it would get to me, would go. <laughs> and I hit nothing but air. Some of us have been hitting nothing but air every time we take a swing at life. Test and tune. And we don't take the tuning too well. Amen. We know what we ought to do. We know how we ought to act. But bless God, we're going to fight against it every step of the way. Amen. Test and tune. Mary said, don't you care that you caused our hearts to hurt? He said, I've got to be about my father's business. I want you to turn over to Luke, the 24th chapter. I'm not going to preach long anymore. Two hours. <laughs> now there were three in Luke 2. Mary and Joseph had to go back to Jerusalem. They went one day. They went back and it took them three days. And then they had to go back. That tells me that we ought to get it right the first time. <coughs> that we ought to keep it right every day. And we won't have to keep going back and forth, back and forth. Amen. Our lives are spent by going back and forth. I forgot to tell you this. When I went after that hose... I drive at 55 mile an hour. You won't catch me speeding now. I might drive 50 or 45 sometimes. But I will go fast and I get to the drag street. I had one car to run in behind me. <laughs> I looked at him. 55. He pulled out, pulled back in. Pull out, pull back in. Finally, here he went. I passed him three times. <laughs> I did. And when we pulled in front of Bob Noble Park, I was sitting right there and he was right in front of me. And I thought, like, where are you going? <laughs> Our lives are a mess, folks, and we are hurry to get there, but we don't know how. Confusion. Now we're going to see a different story. There was three Mary and Joseph went back to Jerusalem. Now we're seeing two of the disciples of the Lord. And it says that they were going to the village of Emmaus. This is in the starting in the 13th verse. They were going to the village of Emmaus. And it was about eight miles that they were going to go from Jerusalem to Emmaus. So as they went along, they were really sad. Why were they sad? It's because that Jesus Christ had been crucified on the cross and that he had been buried in the tomb. Now their thought was, as they walked that along to Emmaus, they began to discuss what had happened prior back in Jerusalem. It didn't happen 
nothing like they thought that it was. They thought when Jesus came, when Messiah came, he was going to set up the earthly regime of God upon this earth. That he would come and Israel would be victorious over all their enemies. That how peace, joy, happiness, all these things would be there. So there's talking about it. And then it says that Jesus, he joined them. He joined them. And he was listening to the conversation that they were having. So if you look over with us. Go back to the 15th verse. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. First thing I want you to see. Jesus always comes where we're at. Always. We never, anywhere in the Bible, we don't find people with the exception of Mary and Joseph we never find anybody going looking for Christ. Don't ever be guilty of this statement. When I found the Lord, He has never been lost. You did not find Him. He found you. If you're here today, why are you here? Well, I come to appease my wife. Well, if that's the only reason you're here, you better just pick up and put your big boy britches on and go back to the house. Amen. Well, it's because I'm a member. Get your britches on and go back to the house. How many of you this morning got up and the first thing you did was read the Word of God? Don't raise your hands because I don't think we'll have you. Maybe one or two. How many of you prayed and said, God, I'm praying for crow this morning. Give him something to feed me. Give him something that the lost would be saved. Give him something. How many of you prayed for your children, your husband, your wife, your mom, your dad? They're talking about what about Jesus. Here Jesus drew near and, and he joined them. But in the 16th verse, it said that their eyes were what? Hold. That means like a veil being placed over. They did not know that this was Jesus that had got out of the grave. Their mind was still thinking, he's dead. It didn't happen the way I thought it was going to happen. This is what the disciples said. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said to them, What manner of communication are these that have one to another as you walk and are sad? Boys, why are you so sad? What's wrong with you? What's happened to make you be in this state? 18th verse. And one of them, whose name was Caiaphas, Cleophas, answered and said unto him, Art thou a stranger? Now, underline the word stranger in your Bible. And I want you to write out beside of it, Visitor. Visitor. You mean you are a visitor here in Jerusalem and you do not know what's going on. Now, if you are a visitor this morning, <coughs> do you understand what's going on? This is a place of worship. There is nothing holy about the walls, the piano, the organ. These are just instruments and this is just a building. There's nothing holy about it. We are the house of God. As saved, He comes to indwell us. We're the house of God. This building is a designated meeting place for us to worship God. Amen. That's all. No more, no less. If you come from a church, and I did, that said when you walked into these doors, shh. Yeah. Be quiet. This is all. Be quiet. This is all. We teach our children to pray. First thing. Fold your hands. Where in the world did you 
you get that? That's what man said, so that's what I'm going to do. God didn't say anything about boldness. He did say humility. He did say humbleness. That's a sign of humility. I can't find anything humble about that. It don't work. It's the heart, it's the mind, it's the intent, it's the inside. And say, if you mean you're a visitor here and you don't know what's going on? And so they told him that what was happening. And Jesus said, this is in the 19th verse, underline that, what things? What's made you sad? What's happened prior to this? What things? So they began to tell him. They said, Jesus, he was a prophet. He performed many miracles. They led him before the high priest. And he had him, or the high priest led him before the government. And they had him condemned to the cross. He was crucified. He was buried. And said then, the women marrying them, they went to the tomb the third day. And they saw a vision. <coughs> Listen. This wasn't a vision they saw. It was reality. Because the angel of God said, He is not here. He is risen. It was a real angel in a real human form that said that to him. So, after that was done, he said some of the men went and it was not that. So he said, Here we are right now. We thought he had set his kingdom up, but he didn't set his kingdom up, and so we're, we're on this road. And then this is what Jesus said in the 25th verse. Old fools and slow heart to believe all that the prophets have said. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And it's the 27th verse. He said he started at Moses and he preached to them all the way up to Jesus. Now it gets interesting now. <laughs> all day long. All day. Something happened. Eight hours. At least eight miles. Those boys walked along with Jesus. Something going on. We're fixing to see the bomb go off. They didn't know who they were talking with. They questioned, why don't you know this? Well, evening came. And they listened to Jesus all day long. And said, Jesus, it's almost supper time. It's almost dark. They didn't know it was Jesus. They constrained him to come in and spend the night with them. Now here he comes. 31st verse, 30th verse, and it came to pass as he said it meet with them, he took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it unto them and their eyes were open. Underline that. And their eyes were open. Underline this. And they knew him. And they knew him. What caused them to know him? It wasn't until he took the bread and broke it and gave it to them. Why is that significant? What does Jesus say he is to the world? It starts with a B. The bread of life. Symbolically, he was showing us that the only way that our eyes is ever going to be open is to taste Jesus. By faith, invite him in. Then their eyes were opened. 32nd verse, and they said one to another. Well, let's go back to the 31st verse. After their eyes was opened, what happened to Jesus? He just got. Then they said to themselves, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the wayside? And while he opened to us the scriptures. Yeah. Almost did something this morning, but I'm not going to do it. I don't want 
want you to unlike our president he does not like our president I used to everybody used to ask me Glenn do you lie? I said no I'll tell them two or three different ways to keep them lying <laughs> that's what our president does have you noticed we don't know how to speak truth anymore. I watched him on TV and said, did he lie? No, he didn't lie. This is our Congress and Senators. I don't know. If I know something is right and I won't tell it, what is it? It's just a bald-faced lie. So, Jesus disappeared out of their midst. He said, did not our hearts burn within us while we walked and he opened the scriptures? There's only one thing that's going to breathe life into you is the word of God. There's only one thing that's going to show you the way to heaven. That's the word of God. Amen. What caused this to, to, for them to say, did not our hearts burn within us when he opened the what? The Word of God, the Scriptures, He taught them, He preached to them. Now let me say to you, what is it going to take in order for you to see the way that you live is not going to get you into the presence of God? What will it take? Most of us live miserable lives. I had a guy who worked for me back years ago when we were here and he went to Carroll one night I don't know whether they ever told me this or not but I, I can't hardly look at a bathroom anymore unless this always comes to mind he the police department called me and said does this certain fellow work for you I said yes sir they said we got him in jail drunk disorderly fighting police I said, I'll be there. I knew a lady that knew the judge. I shouldn't have done this as a Christian should. But I called her and made arrangements to get him out. When I got there, the door was open, the police station, and water running out. Miss Parker was with me. It was about 1 o'clock in the morning. I said, they must have a busted water line. Got inside, and this man that worked for me had tried to kill himself. He took his shirt off, stuffed it down in the commode, and stuck his head down in it and just kept flushing it, trying to drown it. See? I can't look at the commode like I used to. <laughs> it don't work. You ever seen that cartoon? The guy flushing himself down the commode saying, Goodbye, cruel world. <clears throat> I've never seen a man commit suicide in a commode, but buddy, he give it a shot. <laughs> and I just can't think of that in my world. <laughs> you say, well, I've never done it. You've done worse. I got him home. They had thumped him something terrible. About three days later, I said, come here, I want to talk to you. I said, would you give me $500 to whip the far out of you? Grab you around the neck and stick my finger down your throat and you puke till your socks would come up and me throw you over there in one of those stalls and lock you up. He said, are you crazy? I said, no, but you are. You call that fun. Got whipped, got sick, got beat, got thrown in jail, cost five hundred dollars, and him saying, "Man, I had a great time." <laughs> Something is wrong when a man thinks that's fun. Amen. I used to. I really did just brag about it. Just that's the ignorance. That is the height of stupidity. And nothing fun about that. But the word changed them. Did not our hearts burn within us when he spoke the word of God? You that got saved, that are saved, 
Wasn't it a relief when you asked Jesus to come into your heart and you realized that you were free from your sin debt? Amen. Now you get saved. You don't pray. You don't read your Bible. You come to church whenever that you want to. <clears throat> if I take this Bible and get you off back there and give you a quiz, and ask you to explain the triune God. How many of you could answer? <coughs> Miss Barbara says she could. If I said Trinity, explain the Trinity to me. Explain how the blood works. Explain to me the sequence of the rapture of the church. Explain to me about the Holy Spirit, how He comes and lives in you, and why He comes and lives in you. Explain to me about the new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. Explain to me and tell me the commandments in the Bible. You say, well, I know them are 10 of them, or 614 of them. Explain to me why God even had this thing wrote. Well, I can't. Why? It's because we get involved with other things and we neglect this. Do you know why their hearts burn? They knew the Word of God. All he did was remind them of the Word of God. And the veil was taken <coughs> off their eyes because of the Word of God. Amen. Now, we're fixing to shut up. I want you to look all the way down with me. It's the 34th verse. In the 33rd verse, it said that they, when Jesus left, they did not tarry. They did not stay at the house that they were at. Immediately, they turned and went to Jerusalem. Why? Because they had something to say. When they came from to Jerusalem to Emmaus, they were sad. But when they left Emmaus and went back to Jerusalem, they couldn't wait till they could get there. Why? 33rd verse. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they said, they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of the bread. <coughs> Man, that's good stuff. Now I can understand. Mary and Joseph was too busy to see where Jesus was. They left not knowing where he was. Not taking him along. The disciples, they were sad because they thought everything was over with. But when Jesus opened their eyes through the Word of God, they got excited. And they went back to Ruth and said, hey, we got this thing wrong. Jesus didn't, He's not setting up an earthly kingdom, but He has resurrected from the dead. We've got a living God. You name all the religions in the world. Oh yes, by the way, did you know that 30% of the age of 25 and under in America are atheists? Do not believe in God? Barbara and I were taught about God. We taught our children about God. Their children, I don't know so much about. But what about their children's children? And their children? Have you taught your children about God? Amen. That's what we're paying you for. Honey, it'll not get done. I'll do all I can to teach them. But if it don't start in the house, it's not going to start. 
One more little thing. I thought it was going to close while I go, but it's not. Listen. I want to ask for a show of hands. Every night, how many of you as a family at a certain time sit down and eat supper together? Kentucky Fried 
received Christ and God filled me, baptized me, indwelt me by the Spirit of God. And I ain't never lived the same again. Have you sinned? Yes, I've sinned. Have you ever backslid on God? Yes, I have. I'm just telling you like it is. I am what I am. But one thing I'm not, I am not going to hell. So, who are you and what are you? You don't have to be what you are. You can't be someone else. Let's stand together.